but with a focus on three dimensions. And also, I want to talk in the second lecture a lot about topological semi-metals. Uh, and the kind of common theme I want to focus on is once you have a topological material, say a topological band structure, what new kinds of transport or optical effects do you get? So what new electromagnetic responses? And I'll remind you why that was interesting. That's how the quantum Hall effect was discovered and the original Hall effect. Uh, and then how that works in some of the new topological phases. And I'm mostly going to focus on three-dimensional topological phases to make it a bit different from what you've heard before. Uh, but many of the same concepts, like the Berry phase, will appear again. Uh, so I'm going to go through, let's see. Uh, very quickly, some of the background that you heard before. And I think my first 10 or 15 minutes will be very close to what you've already heard, maybe with a slightly different emphasis on a few things. Uh, and then I'm going to focus on, with a 3D topological state, 3D topological insulator, what kind of electromagnetic response do you get? And there's sort of an interesting history there where uh, it turns out that particle physicists thinking about totally different physics, about how a particle called the axion would couple with matter, uh, we're thinking in a very abstract sense about topological insulators in 3D uh, without thinking about band structure, without knowing about Z2 invariance and things like that. And I, I, it turns out that understanding magnetoelectric behavior had to wait for the discovery of topological insulators. Uh, the second part, with metals, um, Claudia Felser already talked about one of the results I want to build up to, which is we think the first example of a certain kind of quantized effect in nonlinear optics enabled by new wild semi-metals. That'll be the punchline of lecture two. And then lecture three uh, is different, although it's still motivated by this question of electromagnetic response. Basically, uh, I'll, I'll motivate it as we can make very good theories for symmetry broken phases that are continuum theories that capture all the universal ingredients, but nothing non-universal. And we would like to do the same thing for topological phases, and at least for the integer and fractional quantum Hall effect, we know how to do that. Um, and actually, that may be used to explain uh, some of the assumptions that go into uh, the interpretation of experiments on quantum Hall edges that you'll hear about. Um, so that lecture is a little challenging uh, on some level, but I'll try to make it exceptional, uh, ex uh, acceptable and exceptional. Uh, TQFT is topological quantum field theory, but all you need to know are things like Maxwell's equations, uh, at least if I do it right. So if you want to read a bit more, uh, lectures one and three are in some Lazouche notes, and, and lecture two is new. And there are a few online lecture notes at that link down at the bottom uh, from a whole semester on this kind of thing. So one way to understand most order in physics is through the idea of symmetry breaking. And this is more than just philosophy. As you all know, when we go into a crystal, we break some rotational and translational symmetries. Um, and a more sophisticated example is that when we have a magnetic material that breaks the time reversal symmetry that you heard about earlier, uh, in addition to breaking the rotational symmetry of spin space. Um, so time reversal symmetry is going to be the hero of a large part of what I talk about. Um, but we should also understand you know, what happens when we break it. Can we still make some useful predictions? Um, and then I think what maybe got me into condensed matter physics was the idea of universality in symmetry breaking phases. And my point is going to be that topological phases have another kind of universality, which is just as interesting, maybe. Uh, so what I mean by universality is just this idea that if you go close enough to a second order phase transition, where, say, the difference between liquid and gas of water is disappearing, then you can measure that difference or the strength of this boiling transition by the difference in densities. And that vanishes as some power law as you approach the critical point. And that power law is about the same for all three-dimensional simple fluids like water. You can also look at how magnetism disappears as you heat up above the Curie point in a simple magnet. And that also has some kind of power law vanishing. And the magic is that these two power laws, as far as we can tell, are the same. And understanding that theoretically was a big success of physics in the 1970s. And in particular, it tells us that if you ask the right questions with symmetry breaking theories, you don't really need to care about many details. You don't need to care about the fact that these are electrons in a solid and very quantum mechanical, and these are classical atoms moving in space. Uh, all those differences are somehow irrelevant close to the transition. 
And something very much like that happens in topological phase, but it's even simpler. Uh, instead of critical exponents, what become universal are simple numbers that you could go out and measure. Uh, and sometimes they might be numbers in the sense of a topological invariant or something, but where it all started was in a fairly ordinary transport measurement, and this you've heard about, uh, the history of Hall at Johns Hopkins from Steve Simon. Uh, the point I want to make, because I'm going to talk about other quantized things and not all of them meet the sort of gold standard of perfect quantization, but the original one does. Uh, in the quantum Hall effect, when you put a magnetic field on a two-dimensional electron gas, at weak fields, you measure a straight line. And normally, this is a useful measurement on semiconductors to tell, many, tell you how many carriers you have and whether they're electrons or holes. But as you increase the field, you get these flat regions. And on these plateaus, first of all, the value is very simple. If I convert it to transverse conductivity, it's an integer times e squared over h. Uh, but second, these plateaus are extremely flat. The value in a properly chosen sample uh, is quantized to about one part in a billion. And that was historically the second example of very precise quantization in sort of a macroscopic system. And the reason why this is surprising is this is by no means a perfect material. In fact, you need a little bit of disorder to get nice big plateaus like this. Um, so it's got disorder, it's got thermal fluctuations, et cetera. Uh, and yet, you get this very perfect answer, and that's where the topology matters. Uh, but a previous example was that if you measure the ac josephson effect between superconductors, which is related to flux quantization, you get an extremely precise measurement of, well, 2e over h. But let's say if you know the number 2, you can get a measurement of e over h. Um, so the point is, by doing two measurements on big chunks of material, uh, you can get very precise measurements of both e and h, which are you know, very small atomic scale numbers. Uh, because of the magic of how topology and quantum mechanics work together. Uh, of course, maybe some even more exciting physics in some ways is in the fractional plateaus, which I won't talk about until lecture three. And then in lecture two, uh, one motivating question is, uh, what could we hope for aside from e squared over h and e over h? Because one point of the lecture today is going to be that there is a kind of quantized response in 3D topological insulators but it actually turns out to be a new way to think about e squared over h. But first, let me build up a bit. So uh, as motivation for thinking about the Berry phase, uh, one of the common ways that topology emerges in physics is that geometry emerges all the time in physics. And if you have some geometrical object like a curvature, and maybe you integrate it over an entire surface or entire closed manifold, then something magical can happen. And the famous example is the Gauss-Binet theorem, which is pictured here. So if I take a two-dimensional surface in three-dimensional space, then at any point, there are two perpendicular radii of curvature. And we define the Gaussian curvature as one over their product with a sign, where positive Gaussian curvature means something like the sphere, where both curvatures are toward me or both are away from me. They have the same sense. And negative curvature is like the hyperboloid. And then the magic is, when I integrate the curvature over the whole manifold, uh, I get something in our language that is quantized or a topological invariant. So for example, the curvature of the sphere is 1 over r squared. The surface area is 4 pi r squared. So the integral of curvature over the surface is 4 pi. Uh, on the other hand, if I took the torus, the positive curvature on the outside cancels out the negative curvature on the inside, and I get 0. And this is uh, an example where we, we made an object out of the basically tangent vectors to the surface, something that's easy to picture. But we can do the same thing with a different kind of vector, which is the complex vectors that exist in Hilbert space, where the surface is different values of a parameter. And that's really where the Berry phase comes in. But first, uh, I'm going to go through this much more quickly than I normally would, because it, it, in almost every detail is what you heard yesterday. Uh, but very briefly, um, we're going to be thinking about until the end of this lecture, when I talk about disorder a bit, we're going to be thinking about just block states. So plane wave times a piece within the unit cell. And the piece within the unit cell is the hero of the story. Uh, it turns out that the fact that electrons have non-trivial k-dependent wave functions inside the unit cell is what makes materials interesting in this topological way. The only thing maybe to keep in mind about the plane wave part is that when you're in a crystal, momentum doesn't range over all of d-dimensional real space, it is basically periodic. It lives on the Brillouin zone, which for us is a torus. Whatever the shape of your favorite Brillouin zone is, 
topologically, it's a d-dimensional torus. So that's going to be the surface that we integrate things over. Uh, and then the curvature is going to come out of the Berry phase. And here, as you heard before, uh, I want to focus on just one aspect of this, because I think you heard uh, the basic story of it, uh, which is that if you take a system adiabatically in parameter space with a non-degenerate eigenstate around a closed path, and you come back to where you started, you build up a phase, and we write that phase as the integral of an object, the Berry connection. Um, but we use the same symbol that we do for the vector potential in electromagnetism. And that's for a reason, because this is really a U1 connection, uh, just like in electromagnetism. And one point of these lectures is to keep all the different gauge fields straight. So you're all used to ordinary electromagnetism, like Maxwell's equations. So those, when I write them, won't have scripts. The Berry gauge fields can be either abelian or non-abelian. And I want to stress the non-abelian one in a slide or two, because actually that's the one that matters for the magnetoelectric effect, which is the answer to the question of what is quantized in the 3D topological insulator, at least what is the electromagnetic response that is quantized. So let me focus on in what sense this is like a gauge field. So just to remind you, if I've got a non-degenerate state at every point of parameter space, uh, I just take a derivative for how things are changing with respect to parameter. And of course, it gets subtle into whether I can choose wave functions that are well-defined over the whole space. Uh, you already heard a bit about that subtlety, so let me not say more. Um, the reason why we think of this like a gauge field is just the only ambiguity in a non-degenerate state is that you and I might disagree on the phase. And we might disagree on the phase of the state in a way that depends on momentum. And if we do that, then we will get different values of this Berry connection. They'll differ by a gradient of the phase, just like in electrodynamics. Uh, but there are some things that we will agree on. We'll agree on the curl of A, which is the Berry curvature. Uh, we will almost agree on loop integrals of A. If it's a loop integral around a non-contractible loop, like a loop that goes through the 1D Brillouin zone, then you heard that it's almost gauge invariant, but it has an ambiguity by an integer, which is why the polarization has an ambiguity of an integer times charge. Now, how does non-abelianness come in? Well, a lot of times in solids, we either have degenerate bands. So we might have n degenerate bands, and it wouldn't make sense to focus on one. Or even if we've got non-degenerate bands, if they're all below the Fermi level, then for many physical quantities, it turns out that energy differences between occupied bands don't actually matter very much. And then the freedom I have is not just a phase change. If you and I are both thinking about the same three-dimensional, say, subspace in quantum mechanics, we might disagree by any unitary three by three matrix, which means that when I make this object with band indices, it's now a U3 connection. It's like something you would see in quantum chromodynamics, roughly, uh, but it's still just the same object. It's just that now I have band indices. But now the quote unquote gauge invariance is some non-abelian group. Um, so you might think this is just mathematical playing around, but I promise it will turn out to be useful a bit later. So that's how any solid with multiple bands might have non-abelian Berry phases floating around in it. Uh, this is the same example, and I also agree that it's worth working through of how to get a Berry phase, first of all, by just thinking about a spin moving in a time-varying magnetic field. Um, so enough on that. Uh, and then the, the first use of this kind of topology in physics uh, so in condensed matter physics, I think uh, the analysis of topological defects was really the first big use of topology. That was maybe in the 70s, uh, vortices and skirmions and things like that. But the first use for electronic structure was this famous Thoulis et al. paper, uh, where the point is, how do you understand the quantum Hall effect uh, if you don't want to be as, I don't know, forward thinking or clever as Laughlin? So Laughlin came up with a new kind of transport, where normally we think about transport in a solid as the electronic states are fixed and electrons move from one state to another. The occupancies change. The point of Laughlin's pumping transport, the reason why that is quite a new idea, is that actually the reason why that's dissipationless is that electrons are not hopping in and out of states. Instead, the states are just moving as the flux gets pumped. So that is a pretty amazing idea. Uh, but Thales's point was effectively if sigma xy is quantized, we ought to be able to see that by taking the Kubo formula and doing enough manipulation on it. 
And indeed, it's not such a hard calculation. I encourage you to look through it sometime. Uh, you find that you can get rid of the energy denominators in perturbation theory, basically, and wind up with just this thing inside the parentheses made from the wave functions. And this thing inside the parentheses is exactly the Berry curvature. So if I integrate the Berry curvature over the 2D Brillouin zone, I get an integer for every band, the churn number, and that integer tells me how much that band gives me to the in the quantum Hull effect if I fill it up with electrons. So one quick note, uh, just to say, amplify a tiny bit about why that's topological or what's special about that integral. Um, there are really two kinds of topology that appear, that are, I think, the most simple that appear in this area of physics. Uh, and they wind up almost being equivalent for many of the things we care about. So there are often two pictures of the topological invariance we want to know. Uh, one is to generalize the notion of winding number. So winding number uh, leads to homotopy. Uh, and these are groups related to the homotopy groups of a manifold. If you give me a manifold, the nth homotopy groups is maps from the n-dimensional sphere to the manifold, roughly. Uh, equivalence classes of those under smooth deformation. And then one way you often would compute those winding numbers, since we're physicists, we like to do integrals. And things like the churn number are something called cohomology. They're basically integrals that are almost independent of path. They're basically independent of small changes of path, but not topologically non-trivial changes of path. And this is sort of what underlies the equivalence of these two topological notions is why, if you want, you can compute the topological invariant of a simple band structure made out of this two-band problem with the unit vector now as a function of kx and ky instead of a function of time. Um, there are two ways you could think about that topological invariant. One is to look at wrapping on the sphere. And the number of times you wrap on the sphere is pi 2 of s2, which is an integer. Uh, the second homotopy group of the two-sphere. But what we've been doing is say, OK, maybe a, a more practical way to compute that, rather than try to count directly how many times it winds, is to make some integral. And that integral is the churn number. Uh, but they're all the same thing. So the point is, I guess, that there are many ways to skin a cat, as we used to say. There are many different ways to do topology in solids, and they often should agree. Uh, and in particular, the Berry phase, the reason why I think several of your lectures are focusing on that rather than the various other ways to present topological invariance is that, first of all, it's been tremendously useful historically. And second, it's not just useful for finding new topological phases and new topological invariance. It often tells you just about ordinary measurable quantities, like the electrical polarization. Um, so the newish things that I want to talk about uh, in the second lecture are mostly related to metals. Um, but the main subject for today, once I talk a little bit about the 3D topological insulators, uh, is going to be something that's very much like electrical polarization, except it's naturally three-dimensional instead of one-dimensional. It's naturally non-abelian instead of abelian. And it is a magnetoelectric effect rather than a polarization. Um, but it turns out, just like with polarization, um, there was kind of an old problem that people maybe knew a little bit was a problem about how to compute something. And then the Berry phase turned out to be the answer to what's going on. So I'm going to flash through the two-dimensional Z2 topological insulator, because you've heard about that a bit, and then explain quickly how you can generalize that to 3D. And one reason for doing that is uh, once we do the band structure way quickly, uh, which is building on what you heard yesterday, uh, I want to give two other ways to think about it. One is. Uh, so far, except for looking at the edge, we haven't talked much about what's quantized from these Z2 topological invariants. Uh, and then second, I, I want to talk a little bit later about uh, a picture involving disorder. Um, but for now, uh, the basic idea of the newish topological insulators discovered starting around 2005 uh, is that, again, there's a topological invariant. And again, it leads to some kind of edge or surface state, which is a good way to discover these. Um, but what drives the phase, what dimensionality they exist in, and how you see them experimentally can all be different from the quantum Hall effect. Um, so as you've learned, uh, the original way to understand the quantum Hall effect that you find in many textbooks is in terms of Landau levels and so on. But if you want to work through that in a crystal lattice, you can use these block wave functions and churn numbers. Uh, and working on the lattice is very ideal for spin-orbit coupling in a crystal, because spin-orbit coupling is not particularly uniform. It has structure on the unit cell, et cetera. Uh, 
Uh, so this Thouless picture was, I think, regarded as beautiful, but not telling you so much new stuff uh, until 2005 or so when it really came into its full glory. So a quick picture of the, where the topological insulators are coming from microscopically is just to think about spin orbit coupling of the form L dot S, like you learn in atomic physics, where L is orbital angular momentum and S is spin angular momentum. And each of these by its own would be time reversal odd. So together they're time reversal even, which means spin orbit can exist in essentially every material. It doesn't require magnetic material. Uh, now, if you want a picture of what this might do, suppose I fix the spin up. Uh, well, then this is like R cross P, the L. So that's like a momentum dependent force, which is a bit like a magnetic field, except this should be like a magnetic field that is one way for spin up and one way for spin down. Uh, and you can make lattice models, and I will show you one for historical interest. Uh, I think Charlie was too modest to show it, but I'll show you a model uh, that realizes this 2D topological insulator phase, where, say, a very rough picture would be that up electrons go right and down electrons go left. Now, people had that rough picture, uh, but no one really believed it until 2005. Because basically, at first glance, this looks like a, an edge that's a one-dimensional quantum wire. And Anderson told us a long time ago that one-dimensional quantum wires would localize under disorder. So what's wrong in that Anderson picture? Well, the key is that basically this is half of a quantum wire. Uh, and just to quickly, this was originally quantum spin Hall effect. That's still a widely used name. But it's also the 2D topological insulator. For various reasons, we thought, many of us thought, let's say, uh, that this would not necessarily be a stable phase. All the previously existing topological invariants like churn number were zero. So the key idea uh, in the seminal work of Kane and Malie was uh, there's a new kind of topological invariant, which is not an integer. It's either odd or even. Um, and I think the last slide of Charlie's second lecture was an expression for it. Uh, I want to give just a simple picture of where that comes from and then talk about 3D. Uh, so some quick questions. Uh, if there are only two possibilities, how do I tell whether a system is in one or the other? The answer is going to be whether they're an odd number or an even number of time reversal pairs of edge states like this. Uh, and I won't really talk about the Berry phase expression or how it can be seen. So first, I thought I would say, what's a model where this actually happens? Because uh, I agree with the idea as in the Sue Schrieffer Heger model, that it's nice to have a simple model. It makes things a lot clearer. So uh, this started with the model by Haldane, which is maybe the simplest model you can make of a churn insulator, which is just a term for an integer quantum Hall system that lives on a lattice. Um, so one way to do that is just to take something like a square lattice and put a magnetic field through it and use pyral substitution to modify the hoppings on the square lattice. That gives you the so-called Hofstadter problem. And if your flux is commensurate with the lattice, meaning if you can take some integer number of unit cells and get uh, an integer multiple of the flux quantum, then it's just another 2D band structure. And it's a nice example where you can use that TKNN expression and so on. Uh, but an even simpler example, in a way, uh, is a model that was introduced by Haldane on the same lattice as graphene, the 2D honeycomb lattice. Uh, and let me first sketch what is an ordinary insulator, and then uh, two kinds of interesting insulator that all exist on this lattice. Uh, so an ordinary insulator, well, graphene, a, a good model for graphene would be just to take this first term, which is spin independent nearest neighbor hopping on the honeycomb lattice. And you'll find that there are two bands because there are two atoms in the unit cell, say the atoms that are on the left edge of a horizontal bond or one kind of atom, and the ones on the right edge are another kind of atom, so two atoms in the unit cell. And you'll get Dirac nodes that I think you've all heard from graphene. An ordinary insulator, uh, the kind that is in all the textbooks, you could make by maybe instead of carbon, you've got boron nitride single layer, which means, say, that the A sublattice is boron and the B sublattice is nitrogen. And if you do that, you open up a gap. It's quite a big gap in boron nitride, and it doesn't care at all about spin, and it doesn't break time reversal. And if the Fermi level's in that gap, that's an ordinary insulator. But there are two other choices you could make. So a point that 
Haldane made was if you wanted to break time reversal, you could have a kind of second neighbor hopping, and that would open up a gap. But now, that second neighbor hopping breaking time reversal would have, say, churn number plus one for the upper band and minus one for the lower band. Uh, it turns out that in any tight binding model, all the churn numbers have to add up to zero for topological reasons. So that's a very simple two-band model that has an integer quantum Hall state. And the reason why Haldane was excited about it was that its overall magnetic field was zero. It still breaks time reversal, but kind of like an antiferromagnet. It's got just as much up flux as down flux, maybe. Um, now, one, I think, where uh, the understanding of Z2 invariance started was to take two copies of the Haldane model. Uh, this is the term that Haldane added, but with an extra power of spin in here. And that extra power of spin does two things. It, it brings you back to having time reversal, uh, because before it was time reversal odd, but then I added one more power of spin. And if I just had this term, then this would be like the models I just told you. It would basically be integer Hall effect one way for spin up and the other way for spin down. And this term is actually there in physical graphing. Uh, it, it's not super strong, but it's there. Uh, but then they showed remarkably that you could add more realistic spin orbit coupling that mixed up and down, and yet you would still find that edge state. In other words, uh, it appeared possible to stay in the Z2 topological insulator phase adding so-called Rashba, more complicated spin orbit coupling uh, that did not, that looked like it should mix up and down and destroy the edge. And the reason why the edge is stable, uh, you can answer that either by writing down a bulk topological invariant like you might hear about, or by just looking at directly at the edge and trying to see how it would be stable to letting the up and down spins mix as long as you still have time reversal. And because I'm going to use it in 3D, I'm just going to quickly repeat the time reversal Z2 argument that you heard before. Back in the early days of spin, very soon after it was realized that electrons have spin half, Cromers pointed out, uh, I think Cromers is the one in the middle, if I remember, uh, that integer spin and spin half particles are not just different under two pi rotations, they're different under time reversal. Spin half particles have that crucial minus one. And as was shown, that minus one means that whenever you've got a time reversal symmetric system of fermions, eigenstates come in pairs. Every state is degenerate with and different from its time reversal conjugate. And that, to remain true when I add perturbations that don't break time reversal like disorder, it must mean that scattering processes like this are forbidden. So this is energy versus momentum along that 2D topological insulator edge. And the idea is that that process well, if I allowed that, that would mix the two states in a Cromer's pair that would cause them to split, and that would violate Cromer's theorem. So if I had magnetic scattering, that could happen. But for non-magnetic scattering, it doesn't. And the way this gets around the idea that a one-dimensional wire should localize is that a one-dimensional wire still does localize, but a one-dimensional wire with time reversal that can be made in isolation that's not the boundary of something always has two right movers and two left movers, uh, that same process is still forbidden, but basically I can scatter from the right mover to the left mover that is not its time reversal conjugate. So that check mark process is still allowed. And this is why something like a carbon nanotube we still think is unstable to disorder, but the quantum spin hull edge is very special. Um, so after that work of Kane and Malie, uh, it didn't take a long time for everyone to realize this was quite an interesting new sort of physics, the Z2 invariance and so on. Um, and I'm going to quickly flash up one way at the band structure level to go from two dimensions to three dimensions. Uh, but it, this is maybe made a bit obsolete uh, by the stuff I'll talk about later, which is a, at least it gives you a more elegant expression, even if this is sometimes better for computing things. Uh, but I want to flash this up because maybe it reminds you what are the essential ingredients for why time reversal is so important in making the topological insulator. So the key thing to remember, time reversal acts in a kind of a funny way, which is maybe why people had missed the story until 2005. Uh, time reversal doesn't just act on the block Hamiltonian, the tight binding Hamiltonian, say, at one k point. Uh, it actually takes k to minus k as well, which means there are special points um, so this is the generalization of the two points in the one-dimensional model that you heard about. Um, in 2D, there are four special points, say, where uh, 
k is equal to minus k. Um, and at these points, I should expect Cromer's degeneracies and time reversal invariant block Hamiltonian. But in between, I don't. Uh, so when we go up to 3D, there are eight of these special points. But maybe a better way to think about it is just let's make the most use we can of what we know about 2D. In 2D, uh, we said if we have time reversal invariants, then there are Z2, there's a Z2 topological invariant. Something is either odd or even. Uh, think about a 3D Brillouin zone, say a cube with periodic boundary conditions. Well, the KZ equal to 0 plane is taken to itself under time reversal. The KZ equal to pi by A plane is taken to minus pi by A under time reversal. Uh, but those are actually the same thing because of the periodic boundary conditions, which means that middle plane and this top bottom plane, I should be able to assign a Z2 invariant. Um, and one simple case would be I could make a so-called weak topological insulator by layering a bunch of two-dimensional topological insulators. But this is why there's a new possibility in 3D, because I could actually be, say, topological in this plane and ordinary in that plane, because in between, time reversal is not restrictive. The planes in between do not have as much symmetry as the middle plane. Because if I'm at, say, kz equal to pi over 4a or something, time reversal takes me down there somewhere. It doesn't take me back to where I was, so it doesn't restrict me very much. Um, so you might say, well, if I've got two invariants for z and two invariants for x and two invariants for y, that makes it seem like there's six invariants. If you count carefully, you realize that uh, there's only one new three-dimensional invariant, which is called the strong topological invariant. Um, so that fourth invariant, uh, the strong topological insulator, the way to think about what it does physically to start with is that it gives us a metallic surface state. And just like before, uh, in the two-dimensional case, our surface state was one half of a quantum wire. Now our surface state is going to be one half of a normal 2D metal. So a normal 2D metal, if it has time reversal symmetry, uh, think about the Fermi surface, say. There are always an even number of sheets in the Fermi surface. Uh, they might be separate once I include spin. Uh, they might lie right on, right on top of each other, like if I have SU2 symmetry. Uh, but otherwise, I'll have some even number of Fermi surface sheets. But that's not true for the surface of the 3D topological insulator. Um, the simplest example, and it, don't take the spin directions literally. The point is just that spin at k is opposite spin at minus k. Um, the, the simplest 3D topological insulators basically look like one quarter of graphene on their surface. So if you've ever studied graphene, you know that there's a k point and a k prime point. There are two points in the Brillouin zone that both have massless Dirac fermions. Uh, in something like bismuth selenide, there's only one. And the uh, surface state that was shown in work by Fu and Kane uh, has this also property of spin momentum locking, while graphene basically would have two spin states that are almost degenerate. So graphene has a two-fold spin degeneracy and a two-fold valley degeneracy. So that's a factor of four. We're actually going to use that later on in interpreting experiments. So this is one quarter of graphene. and uh, some materials actually have a surface state like this. Photoemission, which if you've never thought about it before, is just Einstein's version of the photoelectric effect after about 100 years and several billion dollars. Uh, it's gotten a lot better. Uh, but you're still sending in a photon and bouncing out an electron. The difference is just that you're measuring the electron very carefully to figure out, while it was in the solid, what were its energy, momentum, and spin. Um, and the only problem with this technique maybe is that it's very sensitive to the surface and the surface quality. But if you're looking for a surface state, it's quite a nice technique that way. And at this point, there's plenty of other evidence from STM and other things of the surface state. I just wanted to show one figure uh, to kind of explain why I feel the 3D topological insulator is maybe even useful, not just interesting. Uh, so this is bismuth selenide, which is an old material that people would have had lying around because it was a pretty good thermoelectric. Um, it's been known for ages to have a band gap of about 0.3 EV. In other words, uh, until about 2007, uh, people would have thought there were no states between here and down there. Uh, then if you do photo emission, and in fact, maybe the best sign is that there, if go, looking at earlier photo emission on materials like this, there are signs that people had seen the surface state without being biased by theorists for what they should see. Uh, anyway, it doesn't take a lot of bias in a picture like this. That looks like a Dirac cone. 
Uh, it is the predicted surface state. And the thing which is exciting from an application point of view is that the energy scale for this topological behavior is about 0.3 EV. So 0.3 EV is not a lot by semiconductor standards, but that's more than 1,000 Kelvin. Um, so I did my PhD thesis on you know, sub-Kelvin fractional quantum Hall things. So all of a sudden, you have topological behavior in three dimensions, zero magnetic field, conceivably at room temperature, and definitely at 77 Kelvin. So uh, one quick question before I go on to the magnetoelectric business. You might worry so far that we've mostly been talking about non-interacting perfect lattices. Uh, let me give you one trick for the integer quantum Hall effect, at least, the simplest case, to show you that sometimes with very little work, you can solve the problem of adding interactions and adding disorder and still use the Berry phase. And then I'll come on to this uh, electromagnetic response. So examples of what I mean by uh, what is a true phase and how that's related to being, dis being stable to disorder and interactions. Uh, if you think about the Fermi gas, that we believe is stable to repulsive interactions in 2D and 3D. So a Fermi liquid is just a Fermi gas with repulsive interactions that might be quite strong. Uh, but in 1D, that's not true. In 1D, the Fermi gas is not really a phase. It's just one special non-interacting point. Because the moment we add interactions, we get the so-called Luttinger liquid, where the quasi-particles are different than in the Fermi gas. Likewise, disorder sensitivity is something you might worry about. Um, so the integer quantum Hall effect, here is uh, the so-called flux trick. In case anyone ever bugs you about why you know, maybe topological phases don't work with interactions and disorder. So the idea is just to reinterpret the same integral. So this was the integral that gave me the t k n n integer written as an expression involving band structure. So a different way to think about it is instead of thinking about these one electron wave functions, think about the many electron wave function phi naught. And now, instead of how that depends on momentum, I want to think about basically putting the system on a torus and having magnetic fluxes through the two inequivalent circles of the torus. That's what phi and theta are. They're the fluxes. Um, but it turns out that for a non-interacting problem, a little exercise would be to take this expression, assume that phi naught is a Slater determinant, and show that this exactly reduces to the sum over bands of the one electron topological invariant. But the point is that to define this, all you need to know is how the many body wave function depends on fluxes. And if it winds the right way, then you're in the integer quantum Hall state. Uh, unfortunately, it's not as easy to do this for things like the Z2 topological invariance and so on. And that was one motivation historically for what I'm going to tell you, which is the magnetoelectric effect. Uh, so I want to try to answer the question of, in one kind of Z2 topological insulator, um, if I didn't want to think directly about the edge, and if I didn't want to count bands, uh, is there an electromagnetic response that's quantized in the way that sigma xy is quantized in the quantum Hall effect? So the bit of history that I mentioned is that particle physicists were thinking about an interesting kind of electromagnetic coupling uh, that definitely was known to exist in solids, but it wasn't known to be quantized. So and if you're curious, there's a nice PRL by Wilczek that kind of summarizes the thinking at the time and explains it very clearly that maybe you could have a material so that in the material, there was a term in the Lagrangian for the electromagnetic fields that was something times E dot B. And it turns out that the right units are something dimensionless times E squared over H. And the main point of Wilczek's paper was that the something dimensionless, if you're just thinking about the bulk of a material and you can't specify the surfaces. So just like with polarization, if you're thinking about a unit cell and you don't have access to the surface, then Wilczek's point was that theta is actually an angle, the so-called theta angle. Uh, so what's special about E dot B? And, and why are there, this may sound mysterious if you haven't thought about magnetoelectricity and solids, but all this term does is give you the following response. It says that if you have a solid and you apply an electric field to it, you'll generate a magnetic moment. And if you apply a magnetic field to it, you'll generate an electrical polarization. And magnetoelectric materials like that have been studied at least since the 1950s. Um, but, they tend to, but they were thought only to occur in materials that break 
both inversion symmetry and time reversal symmetry. Because this combination, E dot B, is time reversal odd because of the B and inversion odd because of the E. Uh, so certainly there are magnetoelectric materials that produce E dot B and E cross B and all the bilinears of E and B. Uh, but there's something very special about this term, about E dot B in particular. And that is, if I go back and write it in terms of the field strength tensor, it's what we call F wedge F, uh, the second churn form. Uh, so this F wedge F, just writing it out in terms of the field strength tensor with indices, if you like, uh, it's just E dot B in fancy notation. But this is the total derivative of something, which E cross B would not be. So there's something special about E dot B suggesting that maybe it's topological or maybe it's a boundary effect because it is a total derivative. It's a total derivative of A partial A, uh, which is called the Chern-Simons term of electromagnetism. So anyway, if you can believe that theta is an angle, and I'm going to give you a condensed matter argument for why theta should be thought of as an angle if you only have the bulk, uh, then something magic happens. Because as you've already heard uh, in the context of polarization, if you've got something that is periodic and odd under a symmetry, then boom, you've got a Z2 invariant by the following logic. Think about, you know, I think Charlie said it in terms of integers. Let me say it in terms of angles. Uh, so suppose I've got an angle, which means something that's periodic with period 2 pi. If I apply time reversal, then theta goes to minus theta. So which angles are equal to minus themselves? Well, 0 is equal to minus 0. That's true. That's the easy one. Uh, the tricky one is that pi is equal to minus pi. So ultimately, the point of Wilczek's paper, which I want to explain so it doesn't sound so crazy, is that all insulators with time reversal invariant should be either theta equal to 0 insulators or theta equal to pi insulators. And basically, he was right. Uh, and those are the ordinary and topological 3D insulators. Um, and let me draw a picture for why that's true, because so far, I gave you a very different definition of what a 3D topological insulator is. I said it's something that has an odd number of Dirac fermions at the surface. In particular, it's got a metal surface. In general, if you want to measure magnetoelectricity, for example, if you want to measure a polarization, you'd better have a gap system. So to measure this, what you do is you add a small time reversal breaking perturbation, like a weak magnetic field, that will gap the surfaces. And we'd expect, since the surfaces are two-dimensional metals, that will put them into some kind of quantum Hall state. Let's assume integer quantum Hall state. Uh, so now I can give one picture for why theta might be like an angle. So suppose for the moment that theta is 0. So I've just got an ordinary insulator. It had some surface. Uh, and what kind of surfaces could I have if I keep the bulk the same? Well, I could have a boring insulator at the surface, which would be sigma xy equal to 0. But I could also imagine stapling integer quantum Hall layers onto the surface without modifying the bulk. And that sounds bizarre, but that's just the equivalent in higher dimensions of adding charges at the surface to modify the polarization, where I could only add integer charges. So anyway, if I were to do that, I could add some integer n here and some integer m there, and I would shift the surfaces by some multiple of e squared over h. And now uh, we can answer the question of what does it mean to say that theta might be a surface property or that e dot b might be a surface property? Well, I said this is a total derivative of something. It turns out it's a total derivative of surface Hall effect. So imagine I've got a system where the surfaces are in a quantum Hall state. I apply electric field. That gives me some currents that run around the sample, and those produce a magnetic field. So in other words, to say a system has bulk e dot b is not at all different from saying that it has surface quantum Hall layers and all that theta controls, it's just like the polarization, it controls an offset at the surface. But if I'm going to say that the topological insulator is theta equal to pi, then the only way that holds together is if, and this is seen uh, in a pretty promising experiment a year or two ago, and maybe seen even more clearly now by the group of Peter Armitage at Johns Hopkins, uh, it should be true that the surfaces of a 3D topological insulator, if I could gap them with a bit of magnetic field, uh, but I don't want the magnetic field to be so strong that it perturbs the bulk, then I should see uh, half integers rather than integers. And how do we, why did we believe that was true even before these experiments? Uh, well, the key is graphing. Uh, 
One of the experiments that nailed down that graphene was Dirac fermions was, by, was to measure the integer quantum Hall effect in graphene. And so, for example, this data is from Philip Kim's group when he was at Columbia. So normally, if you measure integer quantum Hall in a 2D semiconductor, you see 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 times e squared over h. What if you do it in graphene? Uh, well, these bottom data, I don't know if you can see it in the back, so I'll tell you the numbers. Uh, instead of seeing plateaus at every integer times e squared over h, at least with weak interactions, you see plateaus at numbers like minus 10, minus 6, minus 2, 2, 6, 10. Um, so you've got both positive and negative numbers, which makes sense because graphene is particle hole symmetric. Uh, but the main point is the jumps are by 4, and these numbers are 4 times the half integers. So that's why we believe, this. I take this as experimental evidence, that if you just had one Dirac fermion, you would actually have half integers. And that corresponds to theta equal to pi. And the reason why this is kind of a, this leads you to a, a, a neat formula in terms of the Berry phase. Let me summarize how things are related and then give a better, in some ways, at least a more elegant formula for the Z2 invariant in 3D. Um, so what I've said is that in many insulators, there's an E dot B term. Uh, it's measured by just a fairly conventional measurement. You could take derivative of polarization with respect to magnetic field or magnetization with respect to electric field. And by working through this in detail, you can figure out what microscopically about the electrons determine the theta angle. And at first, you get something that looks uh, bizarre. You get an integral. And this integral is in terms of script A, which is the Berry phase. But it's actually the non-abelian part of the Berry phase that matters. This is the non-abelian Chern-Simons form. Um, but the, the one thing which is magic about this integral is, how can you have an integral that gives an answer that is ambiguous by 2 pi? Well, let me remind you how that worked for polarization very quickly on the board. With polarization, the idea was we said that P was something like uh, integral of A loop integral in the 1D brill one zone dk. Uh, and then we would put an e over 2 pi in front. So where is the ambiguity in this integral? Well, we said a, under a Berry phase gauge transformation, a goes to a plus the gradient of my phase. If I plug that into here, then p goes to whatever it was before plus e over 2 pi times chi, if you want, uh, that I obtained by wrapping around the Brillouin zone and chi that I didn't, which I'll write this way. Um, and that, uh, this is a multiple of 2 pi because chi was a phase. It was an angle appearing. So that gives me p plus ne. So more mathematically, the gauge transformations that we were making were like e to the i chi of k. That's an element of u1. u1, the unitary group of one element, that's just the manifold of that is just the circle. And the circle has a winding number. Uh, if I look at maps from the 1D Brillouin zone to the circle, those could either wind around or they could not wind around which mathematically we write as pi 1 of s1, which means maps from s1 to s1, uh, is the group of integers. So that integral is a more complicated beast, but it's really just the three-dimensional version of this one-dimensional problem. And in particular, the way that the Chern-Simons form was found historically was that Chern had previously been thinking about generalizations of Berry curvature, if you like, or the churn number to higher dimensions. Um, the first one is in four dimensions. There's that object f wedge f. So Churn did that a long time ago, but then he had a clever student or person he worked with named Jim Simons who uh, pointed out that there was an object you could make whose derivative would be the second churn form, or in general, the higher churn form. So this is the object whose derivative is f wedge f. Uh, Simons dropped out of mathematics after a while, but uh, now he's a major supporter of mathematics and theoretical physics. So it's, it's a happy ending, I guess. Uh, that's Jim Simons, the head fund manager. OK, so that's uh, the a use of the non-abelian Berry connection. And now, just like with polarization, something that might not have been clear, because we were talking about uh, 
I'm going to skip that in the interest of time. Um, you know, polarization is useful to think about a simple example of topological phases in 1D, but it's also true that the Berry phase is the way people now in the materials community go out and commute, compute polarization for all kinds of things that are not topological. It's just the standard way to compute polarization of a crystal. Uh, that's also going to be true for that magnetoelectric quantity, that it's a piece of the magnetoelectric effect in everything that has a magnetoelectric effect. But first, let me sketch why uh, maybe people could have guessed beforehand that there was something special about the change in polarization under a magnetic field and that maybe it would be a very universal object. Uh, in fact, this is what I meant before when I said that E squared over H is always the hero uh, until, to, <laughs> until my next lecture. Um, so E squared over H, well, okay, we've already learned that polarization has a quantum or an ambiguity. And in 1D, that quantum is just E. In higher dimensions, uh, well, think about the surface of a material and the physical meaning of that ambiguity is that I can add one charge per unit cell at the surface, which corresponds, since polarization units are surface charge density, to a charge per transverse unit cell area, omega, uh, which is something horrible and lattice dependent. So we want to get rid of that. Well, how can we get rid of that? Well, one way is to ask, uh, what is the magnetic flux quantum in a crystal, which means what is the magnetic field I can put through a unit cell and still have a unit cell. Well, that's one flux quantum per unit cell. And this ratio is exactly E squared over H. And it turns out nothing in this argument is non-interacting. So you can sort of use this to give a many body version of the magnetoelectric polarizability argument. Um, but that's why E squared over H uh, means something in every dimension. It's your contact resistance in zero D or your quantum wire in I mean, it's units of a conductance, but you get what I mean in, in 1D. Uh, it's Hall conductance in 2D, and it's magnetoelectric quantum in 3D. Um, so in general, if you go back and ask about other materials, uh, anyone here who works on magnetoelectrics will know that there's some big tensor. And so far, I've only been discussing the E dot B part, which is like the diagonal part, the scalar diagonal part of this tensor. And it turns out that with a lot of work, you can figure out the full magnetoelectric effect. Um, so I put up these equations just to show that we do work for a living and life is not always easy and topological and just a simple integer. But let me explain how the magic part, which is the chern simons part, uh, is always there but becomes special if I add some symmetries. So this ordinary part, it looks like a mess, but basically all it is is what you'd expect from a Kubo formula for a magnetoelectric effect. It's got something related to electric dipole and something related to magnetic dipole and an energy denominator and then a bunch of little corrections. Um, so this is what you'd expect. But then there's this extra piece, the non-abelian churn simons part. Um, and that uh, is always there. But what happens if I add time reversal, say, then the ordinary part has to be 0. But this part becomes quantized. Uh, so in general, they're both there, but under either inversion symmetry or time reversal symmetry, the only part that survives is this sort of purely geometric part with no energy denominators. Uh, and now one of our collaborators, David Venderbilt, spent a lot of time trying to figure out how large this new piece is in some materials. I think I'll skip that. I wanted to close with maybe one or two quick comments and then open for any questions. Uh, so first, the magnetoelectric effect, this theta angle, for example, is there but not quantized in plenty of inversion-breaking antiferromagnets. And the sort of reference material is CR203. While in topological insulators, the point of this Armitage experiment, say, is that theta is equal to pi. Um, there are other cases where you get something like theta equal to pi, and now those are often called axion insulators as like a general term. And there's one I wanted to mention because I think this material is very exciting. Uh, so within the category of axion insulators, maybe the simplest is to imagine a material that has both antiferromagnetism and topological behavior. And the way you can do that is even if you break time reversal, you could have a kind of antiferromagnetism where if you pick up the antiferromagnetic order and move it over by a bit and then apply time reversal, then you get back to where you started. And that's an antiferromagnetic topological insulator uh, 
We thought it might be there in gadolinium platinum bismuth, which turns out to do other interesting things. This is a material that Claudia highlighted. Uh, but there is a material, manganese bismuth telluride, seems to be a very beautiful material, hard to grow, but people have succeeded, uh, that realizes this antiferromagnetic topological insulator phase, where the way to think about it is it's basically like a stack, in crystal terms, of 3D topological insulator layers with magnetic layers between them, and the magnetic layers sort of alternate antiferromagnetically, which means if you make a step edge, in principle, you should be able to see sort of 1D quantum hall edges running along the step edges, which that no one, well, there may be a group in Tsinghua that has seen it, uh, Ya Yu Wang and collaborators, but I'm not sure if it's uh, totally agreed on yet. Um, so I think in the interest of time, I'd better uh, stop there and save the rest for next time. Yeah, I can tell you there's an original version and then a new version that I saw in a talk, but I don't think is published yet. So uh, the idea is, and uh, this is a nice example of maybe optics adds something, uh, which I'll come back to later. Uh, so 90% or more of electromagnetic responses and topological phases have been measured with transport. This is an experiment using terahertz optics, where the basic idea is we believe there's a 3D topological insulator. Uh, it's in a magnetic field. So the idea is that if that theory is right, then we should have some uh, sigma xy is some half integer here, let's say 5 halves e squared over h, and maybe 3 halves e squared over h down here. Now, the problem is if you measure transport, normal transport tends to be dominated by the edge. And the, these basically come together at the edge of the sample. And you measure them in combination. So in transport, you would measure an integer Hall effect. Uh, the idea of being able to do time domain optics is that you can come in with light and see the two surfaces uh, and basically measure them more independently than you can with DC transport. And the claim, so there is a science paper. Uh, and then more recently, they think they have a better way to sort of independently measure the two surfaces. Uh, but the claim is that by not being at zero frequency, so by not being in the usual topological limit, uh, you can imagine, for example, that if this were very thick, maybe your light would come in and never make it to the other surface. Um, what you're measuring, to measure sigma xy in optics, uh, that's, that gives you the so-called Faraday effect. Uh, it means that if you start with linearly polarized light, then as it passes through this edge, uh, it gets rotated by some angle. So you're measuring the so-called Hall angle. And they can see in their data very beautifully uh, plateaus of that Hall angle. And then what they had to kind of argue in the original paper, and what I think they have additional evidence for now, is that the plateaus in the Hall angle uh, can only be explained by two spatially separated contributions. Um, so it's effectively, if you like, using terahertz optics to try to separate the contributions from the top and bottom of a topological insulator when it's in a magnetic field and overall in a quantum Hall phase. Uh, what surprising from your effects would you expect from these type of 3D guys and magnetic layers? <laughs> well, I think you know better than I do. Uh, yeah, so I, I can tell you the way that, OK, I, I haven't thought about this for a few years, but here are the ones that I think are interesting. Uh, uh, OK, so some surfaces will have this stack, uh, which ought to be visible in STM. And other surfaces will have the more conventional Dirac-like surface. Uh, as far as what you could do with this, uh, I think being able to bring these edges together and make sort of junctions between, uh, I, I think it might give you a new approach to making some kinds of devices that people like Ronnie Alon and Fernando de Juan and Adolfo Grishin, I think, have thought about in other contexts. So I think it, it's a new platform to make edge states is probably the main thing I know. I haven't thought much, I mean, you, you could hope to make it superconduct or something like that, but I just think as a clear example of an axion insulator driven by a magnetic structure that we understand, that's already a breakthrough. <laughs> 
Um, yes, but I think in general, uh, there is progress. So let me state the question one way. Uh, if you look at the tenfold way, um, so uh, there are, there's a belief that if we don't worry about crystalline symmetries, which are complicated, so if we just think about uh, time reversal symmetry and chiral symmetry like in superconductors, then there are basically 10 classes of symmetries. And in every dimension, five of those have a topological invariant, uh, some z and some z2. And you can ask which of those have some kind of interpretation as a response. Um, so we wrote a paper with a partial answer, and then it was uh, completed by a smart person named Edward Witten. Uh, so the part that you, know, you can understand, that I can understand, say, are things like electromagnetic responses. So we could say, well, these invariants in these dimensions, including many of the Z2 invariants, have an electromagnetic response, but some of them did not. So at least at the time that we were working on it, and this was with uh, Shinsei Ru and Andreas Ludwig, there were some where we could not recognize any electromagnetic uh, so-called anomaly that would explain what was going on. Um, so what was left? Well, maybe some kind of gravitational anomaly. Uh, and then what, uh, but we, had, we didn't know how that would work. Uh, and then there's a like 100 page paper by Witten explaining how that works. So not everything has an electromagnetic interpretation, but it seems like at least everything in the tenfold way in high enough dimension, I mean, zero D is a little special, uh, but in high enough dimension has either a electromagnetic or gravitational interpretation. Okay, so let's uh, thank Joel again.